Good morning. Welcome to beautiful Savior Lutheran Church. As usual, uh, if we have people that uh, want to make an announcement to the good of the congregation, let me come forward at this time. Okay, this is the first Sunday of the month. This is on Sunday, so if you know, we take up a collection for those who are less fortunate that end up coming by and asking for help. So we give them gift cards. So at the end of the service, they'll be a basket back there and over here. And if you have any extra money, you know I always like money, uh, please contribute to it. Uh, good morning. Uh, I, I was just going to say that some of, of the ladies that belong to LWML won't be here next Sunday because next, starting next Friday we have our LWML uh, convention and we'll be in Memphis at um, Christ, I, Christ the King and what's at Hyatt or whatever that oh, Hilton, whatever that place. I don't know what they call it now. But anyway, so if we're missing next week, you'll know why. Well, good morning. Good morning. Uh, many of you know I'm Pastor Neil Vanderbush, and um, it was, uh, I guess, a year and a half ago, my family and I uh, began coming to Messiah. I was the former pastor at Emmanuel in Memphis, and I went on a um, uh, disability for um, my cancer treatments for, for medical needs, and took a break from ministry. I took emeritus status. Our family um, had a lot of hardships and we needed to find a good congregation to land in and a beautiful savior was that. My kids came down here and visited and said, wow, dad, uh, this is where we need to be going. And we live, uh, it takes us a good 45 minutes to get here on Sunday and it's definitely worth a drive. Uh, this, this time has been uh, an interesting time for our family. I've been in full-time ministry since 2006. And so uh, taking a step back from church leadership is, it, it's interesting, but it's also been uh, very rewarding. I've been very thankful to you all for allowing me to be a part, but also very thankful to Pastor Myers as uh, his, his servant leadership here at Beautiful Savior has been a gift. And he's also afforded me the opportunity to, uh, to, to be a part and to help out. Um, in December, uh, after talks with my physicians and then also the, uh, our district president, uh, we released my name to be able to be considered for future calls. And um, I was alarmed at the amount of need in the church, uh, the amount of context that I received uh, across the synod was, it was alarming. Uh, the amount of call lists that I landed on, but then I also received several calls and also offers to be intentional interim, because I also have a history of being an intentional interim in congregations. Um, I, I turned down several calls, but I wound up accepting one to Messiah Lutheran Church in Bernie, Texas. Bernie, Texas is just to the northwest of San Antonio, and it just so happens to be right where one, my son and his family lives, next door to it, uh, a neighboring community, and it's also the, the area where Michael and Abigail, the Coonies, have, uh, they've relocated down there. Michael was going down there for college. It was like all of these pieces, we were working them independently, but God was working them uh, together. And so um, this is my final Sunday here with you all. Next Sunday, I will be installed as pastor at Messiah down in Bernie. And I look forward to, to worshiping with them and uh, being with them. Now, Holly and Aiden will be with me next Sunday, but then they'll, Holly will be back with you uh, following. Uh, as She will be here with uh, our home until it sells. I want to thank you for your many prayers. And I also ask you to please uh, keep us in prayer as we hope that our house sells, but also know that our, our hearts are sad, that it's very difficult leading beautiful Savior because what you have meant to us as far as a very difficult time in our family's time, but how your ministry as God took care of us through you. I just want to say thank you. And uh, this congregation will always have such a special place in our hearts. And I have such high regard for you all. So thank you very much for allowing us to be a part of your family. Stay there. Uh, thank you, Pastor Vanderbush, for that announcement. And um, the church wanted to get you something. As, as many of you know, Pastor Vanderbush has been helping me serve up here in the chancel. 
but also uh, helping me with some pastoral care and mentoring me along the way. And he's been doing that out of the kindness of his heart. Um, we haven't paid him anything for the help he's done here. So the church wanted to get you some gifts. Um, first of all, I have this picture because the pectoral cross we ordered is coming from Ukraine. <laughs> the shipping takes a little bit in, oh, wow. in certain parts of the world right now. So that's on its way. Uh, that's a pectoral crucifix. What did get here in time is uh, this white chasuble. So you can take that with you to Bernie. And this is a check for the remainder of the gifts that the congregation gave that, that didn't go towards those two things. So. But y'all love <laughs> You didn't have to do this. And you know that you no, didn't have you. to do this. You. But, um, you know, just for a moment there, I thought I was lost to ministry. And, um, you know, cancer can be scary. You know, it uh, takes it's, takes lives all the time. I have very many friends with cancer. And uh, sadly, even in my cancer fight, I have uh, lost friends and have, um, have done their funerals. But to know that the Lord is uh, restoring me to ministry is a great gift. And y'all didn't have to do anything, but I accept the gesture. And, um, and I, your partnership in the gospel has been a gift. And I want you to know, a beautiful Savior has a pastor that is phenomenal and do whatever you can to keep the guy and uh, be praying for him and his family. And we're just thankful for uh, for for your ministry and what you've done. Um, please know that we will continue to lift you up and um, to be your partners, even though we're far away. Um, we're going to be close in spirit and in heart. So thank you. Thank you very much for this. You know, you didn't have to, but I appreciate it. Just a few quick announcements from me. Uh, first of all, just keep in mind, um, I'm sure some of you noticed that we did not have Sunday school this morning. We are taking a summer break from Bible class on Sunday mornings. Um, so we will be in touch with announcements about what that's going to look like when we pick back up in the fall. Uh, but no Sunday school, June, July, or August. Same thing with men's group and young families. Those are on summer break as well. Um, and we're going to come back with a roaring spirit uh, with all those activities in the fall. Uh, but we are taking a short summer break from that. Grief group and our Wednesday night study will still continue to meet during the summer. Um, so grief group is the last Saturday of every month at 2 p.m. And Apologetics 101 is our new Wednesday night study and that's at 6.30 p.m. So uh, please be sure to join us for that, especially if you're interested in apologetics. Um, I think it's very uh, interesting discussion of how to defend the faith in uh, the world that we live in. In the service today, uh, one quick announcement is that Donna, our organist, is not with us. She um, took a fall yesterday morning, so she is in our prayers. She is fine. Uh, she went to the doctor. Nothing's broken. Um, but her, she's still in a, quite a bit of pain in her back, so she didn't want to sit at the organ bench this morning, which is totally understandable. And so we do have the iPad this morning, so I ask, as always, that you bear with us um, when we're using technology. Technology, as you know, does inhabit demons sometimes, and I'm not joking about that. Um, so if things go crazy with the volume, or if things get played when they're not supposed to, that's not Chad's fault, that's the demon's fault. And uh, we ask your patience with that. On that note, the Lord's Prayer is the one thing to watch out for when we sing the Lord's Prayer uh, today, which is one of Pastor Vanderbush's favorite things to do. So we're going to sing the Lord's Prayer. When we sing the Lord's Prayer, it'll just be the intonation first, and then we'll sing the Lord's Prayer a cappella, and then at the end, the doxology, the organ will play as we sing the doxology to the Lord's Prayer. So um, just be on the lookout for that when we do the Lord's Prayer, that that, that part will be part a cappella. In the sermon today, we're going to be looking at the Old Testament reading from Genesis when God says to Abram, Behold, I am your shield and your exceedingly great reward. And we're going to be talking about why it is that Abram needs a shield and why we need a shield in our lives and what it looks like for Christ to be our shield. So be on the lookout for that in the readings and God's blessings on your worship.
the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching Him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. Amen. Heaven and earth. I said I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. And you Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor miserable sinner, confess unto you all my sins and iniquities, with which I have ever offended you, and justly deserve your temporal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them, and sincerely repent of them, and I pray you of your boundless mercy, and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death, of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, a poor, sinful being. Upon this, your confession, I, by virtue of my office as a called and ordained servant of the word, announce the grace of God unto all of you. And in the stead and by the command of my Lord, Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. O Lord, I have trusted in your steadfast love. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord, because he has dealt bountifully with me. How long, O Lord, will you forgive me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I take counsel in my soul, and have sorrow in my heart all the day? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? Consider and answer me, O Lord my God. Light up my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Let my enemies say, I have prevailed over him. Lest my foes rejoice, because I am shaken. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. O Lord, I have trusted in your steadfast love. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord, because he has dealt bountifully with me. The Lord be with you. And with thy spirit. Let us pray. O oh God, the strength of all who trust in you, mercifully accept our prayers, and because through the weakness of our mortal nature we can do no good thing, grant us your grace to keep your commandments, that we may please you in both will and deed. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. lesson this morning is from Genesis, the 15th chapter, verses 1 through 6. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, saying, Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your exceedingly great reward. But Abram said, Lord God, what will you give me, seeing I go childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus? And Abram said, Look, you have given me no offspring. Indeed, one born in my house is my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, This one shall not be your heir, but one who will come from your own body shall be your heir. Then he brought him outside and said, Look now toward heaven, and count the stars if you are able to number them. And he said to him, So shall your descendants be. And he believed in the Lord, and he accounted it to him for righteousness. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. The psalm comes from Psalm 33, verses 12 to 
22. It can be found in your worship hymnals, and we read this responsibly. I begin with verse 12 of Psalm 33. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people whom he has chosen as his heritage. The Lord looks down from heaven. He sees all the children of man. From where he sits enthroned, he looks out on all the inhabitants of the earth. He who fashions the hearts of them all and observes all their deeds. The king is not saved by his great army. A warrior is not delivered by his great strength. The war horse is a false hope for salvation, and by its great might it cannot rescue. Behold, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him, on those who hope in his steadfast love. That he may deliver their soul from death and keep them alive in famine. Our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. For our heart is glad in him because we trust in his holy name. Let your steadfast love, O Lord, be upon us, even as we hope in you. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. The epistle lesson is from 1 John, the fourth chapter. I begin with verse 16. And we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love. And he who abides in love abides in God, and God in him. Love has been perfected among us in this way, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. If someone says, I love God, and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? This commandment which we have from him, that he who loves God must love his brother also. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Right. every day. But there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, full of sores, who was laid at his gate, desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. So it was that the beggar died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried, and being in torments in Hades, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. Then he cried out and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and you are tormented. And besides all this, between us and you there is a great gulf fixed, so that those who want to pass from here to you cannot, nor can those from there pass to us. Then he said, I beg you therefore, Father, that you would send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, that he may testify to them, lest they also come to this place of torment. Abraham said to him, They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, No, Father Abraham, but if one goes to them from the dead, they will repent. But he said to him, 
They do not hear Moses and the prophets. Neither will they be persuaded, though one rise from the dead. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise be to thee, of shields and bucklers, you might not even know what the word buckler means, seems like a far off distant idea, something you might see in a museum. A buckler, in case you're wondering, is a small round shield. Sometimes in the King James Version and older translations, you'll read the word shield and buckler whenever it's talking about the Lord being our shield. And in fact, I think the idea of warfare in general, in general, seems somewhat far off to us. Something that happens, yes, it happens all the time, we see it on the news, but it's happening in faraway countries that you may not even be able to point to on a map. Now, of course, there are exceptions. If you are a veteran or even active duty in law enforcement or in the military, maybe you've been a little more up close to warfare, to the idea of defending yourself with some kind of shield, with some kind of body armor. But in general, I think these things are far away from us and we try and stay far away from them. You're smart enough to not go to certain parts of Memphis even if you carry a firearm on your person, you do that for rare, hopefully rare, emergencies. The idea of warfare, of having to engage in a battle for your life, it seems like something that maybe we think about now and then, but it seems like something distant to us. What is not distant to us is fear. While maybe we are not fearing for our physical life every moment, like a man who is battling in warfare, who is literally carrying around a buckler or a shield, literally carrying around a sword, the idea of fear itself and fear itself being in our lives is not foreign at all. The Lord says to Abram, do not be afraid, Abram, I am your shield, your exceedingly great reward. And what is Abram afraid of? He's not engaged in warfare, at least not at the moment. This is not the time when he goes out with hundreds of men and rescues Lot in a warfare fashion. That had already happened. But now he is afraid of something deeper. He is afraid that his life will be meaningless. That the promises God gave him three chapters ago in Genesis 12 would somehow not come true for him. That his devotion to God, that his devotion to the Lord and everything he's given up, how he's moved far away from his family. How he's had to travel around and fight off Philistines and fight off Pharaohs. That all of it was worthless. He was worried and he feared that his great wealth that he had built up, built up, all of his sheep and all of his oxen and all of his cattle, that they would go to someone who was not his own family, that he would not leave a legacy behind. He feared that he had made a terrible decision in following God's call to service. And if you tell me that you're not afraid of things like that, I would doubt you. I'm afraid of things like that. Fear is part of the sinful condition which you all have. And even though warfare and carrying around a shield, and carrying around a sword might be foreign to you, you still fear all sorts of things. You fear still your physical well-being. Maybe you're not afraid of your life. 
like a man in a bunker. But you still fear your physical well-being. It's why you go to doctors. It's why you lock your doors at night. At least most of you probably lock your doors at night. Maybe you remember a time when you didn't have to lock your doors at night. But now you do because you fear. But more deeply than that, like Abraham feared more deeply than just his physical well-being, you fear your life being meaningless. You fear that you might get to the end of your life and have nothing to show for it. You fear that the way your life is going right now might not be the right path for you. And that it might put you in a place where you ultimately don't want to be. You fear that God is not actually working out all things together for your good. Maybe he's working out things for good in general. Maybe he's out there helping other people, but for you, it feels like he's not. You fear that you won't leave a legacy behind to your children. You fear loneliness. Abraham feared loneliness. You fear that your family and friends might not stick it out with you when things get rough. You fear that you will be left alone when your family and your friends are gone. And you fear, like Abraham, losing your wealth and status. You fear that if you follow God's commands about taking up the cross and following Him, or about tithing, or about marriage and sexuality, or whatever commandments you are struggling to follow, that if you follow them, it will end up with you being poor or despised by the world. We all fear these types of things. And so what do we do with fear? What does God say to Abraham right after? He says, do not be afraid. He says, I am your shield. The basic idea of a shield, even though you might have only seen a shield in a museum or in one of those fake battles from the Middle Ages that you can go and watch for entertainment, the idea of a shield is very straightforward. It is to block the things that you fear. It is to block the things that attack you. And so we try and shield ourselves, and we try and shield our family, and we try and shield the ones that we love from the things that we fear. Just like Adam and Eve, when they feared God walking in the garden and seeing what they had done, they shielded themselves with fig leaves. Just like Abram tried to shield himself from being lonely and his life being meaningless and God not fulfilling his promises, he tried to shield himself from that by taking matters into his own hands and sleeping with Hagar. And we too, you too, try and shield yourselves from the things that you fear. You try and give your lives meaning by filling them up with events to go to, and people to talk to, and hobbies to have, and lots of work, maybe. Or maybe sometimes you just try and straight up distract yourself from the things that you fear. Maybe that's with time on screens, or time buried in books, or otherwise. If you can just not think about it, then you don't have to deal with it. And some of those things are not bad or sinful. In fact, fear itself does not always have to be sinful. It is right to recognize with fear and trembling what God has given us and to protect it in accordance with his laws. But remember what Luther says about the first commandment. We should fear, love, and trust in God above all things. And so if you are trying to distract yourself from things that you fear because you fear them more than you fear God and His wrath, well then they are sinful. And we try not to be lonely. We try and shield ourselves from loneliness by filling up on maybe one hand, depending on if you're an extrovert or an introvert, on constant communication with other people. 
or by burrowing yourself so deep into yourself that you don't have to think about it. You try not to lose your wealth and your status by shielding yourself with savings, building bigger barns, as it were, and not letting others see the negative things about you or things that can be perceived as negative. Just look at the way that people portray themselves on social media. 99.9% .9 of the time, you will never see someone post a negative thing about themselves. It's all positive. And people want to present to you a certain image of themselves socially. But Abraham, do not fear. I am your shield, says the Lord. And Paul reminds us of this when he says, take up the full armor of God, that we should also take up a shield. And what is that shield that Paul says to take up? It is nothing other than the shield of faith. And what does verse 6 say in Genesis 15? Abraham believed he had faith. And it was counted to him as righteousness. Dear saints, Christ is your shield. He is your shield by faith. You take up that shield, you apprehend that shield, you hold that shield, you have a buckler because you believe in Christ. And that sounds so weak, at least to the world, that the only thing you need to shield yourself from these deep, deep problems like meaninglessness and loneliness and losing wealth and status and despair and even your physical well-being, the only thing you need to do to protect against those things is to trust, to believe that someone else will take care of it for you. Isn't that shirking your responsibility, the world will say. Can't you do it yourself? The world will say. But that's the beauty of Christianity. That our God is a God who is hanging naked and ashamed on a cross. And the real truth, the even deeper than deep truth is this. You can never do it on your own. No matter how hard you try, you cannot medicate yourself out of death. No one has ever lived on this earth and not suffered death. You cannot distract yourself out of feelings of depression and meaninglessness. You cannot friend yourself out of loneliness. You cannot build your way out of poverty and disdain. Death will come, doubts will come, loss will come, the economy could crash at any moment, and it could all be gone, and if the world hated Christ, it will hate you too. And so be honest about that. Be honest about your dependence. Believe on Christ. Believe that his death and that his resurrection is your life. And that dead to sin, you no longer will die, but you will live. And to live in him is to love God and to love your neighbor, and we love because he first loved us. And that this is the good, albeit narrow and difficult and hard, but that this is the good way. That even though it seems hard and difficult now, this will be the way. And on this way that you go, he will be your shield. Because by faith you believe in him and you will live, and by faith you believe in him, and he will be your shield, your exceedingly great reward. For even when this life seems vacuous, even when this life seems meaningless and sad and full of loss, full of disdain, you have, remember the second part of Christ being your shield, an exceedingly great 
reward. And reward is the same way. It seems like we should do something. Any reward you've ever gotten in this life, how have you gotten it? You've gotten it by accomplishing something. You got the reader's rewards in elementary school by reading books. You got the sports awards by competing in the sports and winning. Well, except for nowadays, you just get a reward no matter if you win or not. But ignore that. That's how rewards are supposed to work. You're supposed to win. You're supposed to accomplish something. But again, not with Christ. Your reward is not because you have done something, because you've protected yourself, because you've won it for yourself. Your reward in Christ is because He has done it for you. Because you believe in Him and you have apprehended that reward by faith, by trust in Him alone. And that is a reward, that is a treasure, that unlike any reward you have earned on this earth, moth and rust cannot destroy. And so even when you feel lonely, like no one else could understand what you're going through, you have a Father in Heaven who hears your prayers in secret. And whatever you ask in Jesus' name, He will give to you out of His gracious hand. You have a brother in Christ, an advocate with the Father, who paid the price to bring you into his family, a family that has no end. In this life, you may lose father and mother, you may lose brother and sister. In fact, they may even hate you for believing the gospel. But in Christ, you have a family with no end. And in Christ, you have a spirit, a spirit Paul says, not of fear, but a spirit of power and of love and of self-control. You have God on your side when you are lonely in this life. And if God is for you, who can be against you? And when even you are afraid that following that way, that narrow way, will lead to a loss of wealth or status, take up your cross and follow him. What does it profit a man to gain the world and lose his soul? You may not see it now, but he really is working all things together for the good of those who love him. And wisdom is seeing that that narrow way and choosing suffering now for the sake of glory eternal, rather than choosing glory now for the sake of suffering eternal. But the good news is this, even when you suffer now, even when you are on that narrow way and it seems difficult and it seems hard, He is still your shield. He will still protect you from the worst of things and He will carry you through it. In fact, He says, let me carry that for you. And you take my yoke, which is easy and light. And so, dear saints, my prayer for you this week and always is this. Don't try and be your own shield. It is tempting, but you're not strong enough. I'm not strong enough. None of us are strong enough. Instead, have faith in Christ. Trust in His forgiveness for your sins. Trust in His love that you may love others. And he has done it for you. And that is your shield by faith. For he says to you, my dear son, my dear daughter, do not be afraid. I am your shield. I am your exceedingly great reward. To him be all the honor and glory now and forever. Amen. Amen. We stand for the offer.
And now show the peace with one another in the name of the Lord. We thank you for the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, for your Holy Church, for the means of grace, for the lives of all faithful and just people, and for the hope of the life to come. Help us to treasure in our hearts all that you have done for us, and enable us to show our thankfulness in lives that are wholly given to your service. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Send the light of your truth into all the earth. Raise up faithful servants of Christ to advance the gospel, both at home and in distant lands. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Preserve our nation in justice and honor, that we may lead a peaceable life with integrity. Grant health and favor to all who bear office in our land, especially the President and Congress of the United States, the Governor and Legislature of Mississippi. Help them to serve this people according to your holy will. Be also with our first responders and those who serve in our military, especially Andrew, Nicholas, Ashlyn, Terry, Katie, Mitchell, Kevin, Austin, Mark, Reese, Mike, and Craig. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Let your blessing remain upon the sea time and harvest, the commerce and industry, the leisure and rest, the arts and culture of our people. Take under your special protection those whose work is difficult or dangerous, and be with all who put their hands to any useful task. Give them the just rewards for their labor and the knowledge that their work is a blessing in your sight. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. By your word and Holy Spirit, comfort all who are in sorrow or need, sickness or adversity. Especially Donna, Ed and Georgia, Sam, Vanette, Christine, Morgan, Augustus, Ken, Gary, Dave and Peggy, Sonny, Barbara, Reese, Frank, Denny, Paula, Patricia, John, Sonny, Hunter, Melody, Kathy, Randy, Catherine, Clark, Dina, Brian, Martha, Andy, Cassie, Stephen, Tommy, Dodi, Debbie, Jerry, Dale, Oliver, and the family and friends of Jimmy, Dale, Bailey. Be with those who suffer persecution for the faith. Have mercy on those to whom death draws near. Bring consolation to those who sorrow and grant to all a measure of your love, taking them into your tender care. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. All these things and whatever else you know that we need, grant us, Father, for the sake of him who died and rose again, and now lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Upon you and give you peace. Amen. 